Now, as Virginia mentioned, I have insomnia, and uh, I'm lucky because I know a lot about sleep. I've been practicing it since 71, but I use all my skills to manage my insomnia, and I'm going to share some of that with you uh, today. So let's get started. So here's our objectives for today. So at the end, my hope is that you'll get more of this restful, restoring night's sleep. Uh, I want you to understand basic sleep physiology. It's critically important. I want you to know the changes in sleep that occur with aging. And I'm going to introduce you to some common sleep disorders so that you can recognize them in yourself and in your family. And hopefully at the end of the lecture, you'll know more about how to treat yourself with practical, non-pharmacological solutions to sleep disorders and when to ask for help. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to do it in a layered effect, okay? So I'm going to talk to you first about normal sleep. That's sleep 101. And I'll include in that discussion what happens with aging. I'll talk about primary insomnia. This is insomnia that's unrelated to other sleep disorders or comorbidities, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to talk to you about sleep hygiene measures. These are non-pharmacological ways to treat primary insomnia. There's a whole slew of sleep disorders. I've picked three of them. I'm going to talk to you about that next. And then common comorbidities. These are diseases that impact sleep. Many of you have these problems. We'll end with some drugs that impact sleep, and finally some questions at the end. Now, if I ask all of you to uh, give me uh, your idea of states of being in a 24-hour period, you'd probably say wakefulness and sleep. Now, as sleep physicians, though, we divide sleep into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and non-REM sleep, okay? And I'm going to introduce you to these two uh, stages of sleep. Rapid eye movement sleep is dreaming sleep. Non-REM sleep is largely restorative sleep. Now, how do we divide these two states in a patient who is unresponsive, sleeping? And the answer to that is we do a sleep study or a polysomnogram. And here's a patient who is hooked up uh, and ready to undergo a polysomnogram. And here's how we do it. We put contact sensors around the head, and these contact sensors pick up brain waves. We call this an electroencephalogram, or EEG. We also put contact sensors on either side of the eyes to pick up the small impulses uh, from the muscles that move the eyes so we can know when the eyes are moving. And then we put another sensor under the chin on the mentalis muscle. And with these three sensors, we can stage sleep, and we do that. Ordinary sleep study, about six hours long. We divide it into 30-second epics. We have somebody who sits and looks at every single epic and stages the sleep. And then we have a computer program that collates the whole thing for us. Now, I'm going to talk to you about obstructive sleep apnea. And all these other wires are uh, used to pick up uh, abnormalities in people that have uh, problems breathing at night. So there is a heat-sensitive thermistor and a pressure gauge here. You recognize this. This is a pulse oximeter. We have effort bands on the chest and the abdomen, and I'll tell you more about that later. Now, after a sleep study, when our technician sits down and looks at these epics one at a time, here's what they look for. They look at the brain waves, and here's the EEG uh, of a patient who is awake. Uh, and it's low voltage. Uh, the frequencies are mixed. Here's one second. Here's an amplitude of 50 microvolts. And generally speaking, as you go from drowsiness to sleep, your brain slows down. So the wave frequency slows down. And you can see that here when you're drowsy. Now, non-REM sleep has three stages. There used to be a fourth one, but we've combined that all now in stage three. And you can see here the frequency slowing, finally, until you get to stage three sleep, when the frequency is very, very slow and the amplitude is high. We call this delta waves. 
slow wave, stage three sleep, and this is the type of sleep that restores you, okay? Now, REM sleep looks like this. Now, if you compare the waveform here with awake, you'd say, hey, Bruce, it looks just about the same. And REM sleep is actually a very active uh, part of the night. So oxygen consumption is up, glucose utilization is up, and the brain is actually active at that time. Now, what happens through the whole of the night? Well, non-REM and REM sleep is aggregated, and it cycles. And here's how uh, a normal person in an eight-hour uh, uh, period of sleep, uh, this is how their uh, sleep stages would typically stack up. Everybody normally enters sleep through non-REM sleep. Now, this is an old slide when we had stage four sleep. So they go from stage one, two, and then into delta sleep. And then about rough numbers, uh, 90 minutes after the onset of sleep, you have your first REM period. And it'll last about 20 minutes or so. And then you'll cycle back into non-REM, and then back into REM. And then you do the same thing repeatedly. And this is a fair, fairly young person. And he has one, two, three, four, five sleep cycles during the night. And actually, the end of the night ends in REM sleep. And many of you, I'm sure, if I ask for hands, will wake up in the morning in the middle of a dream. And that's very common, OK? Now, what are the factors that govern our sleep-wake cycle? I love this slide because it summarizes them. So this is our waking neural behavioral functions, our sleep-wake cycle. I'll talk to you first about the homeostatic drive for sleep, because all of you recognize this. The longer the time between your last awakening, okay, the greater the drive is for you to fall asleep. Now, if you've ever been on shift work, and certainly as a, a doctor, we were on shift work, we'd be asked to work 24 hours straight. The longer you're up, the more significant this drive is to put you to sleep. I'm going to talk to you about a circadian drive for wakefulness and sleep in a moment, but this is a, a, a cycle uh, that cycles on a 24-hour basis. I'll tell you more about it in a moment. But first, I want to talk on uh, exogenous and endogenous stimuli, and these will be familiar to you. What are the exogenous stimuli? Well, light is certainly important. The brighter the light, the less likely you are to fall asleep. And that's why we all turn the lights off, and many of us have uh, curtains in our room that are blackout curtains, so it's absolutely pitch dark because that promotes sleep, okay? There are some drugs, and I'll talk to you about caffeine. That's a central nervous system stimulant that keep us awake. Now, the task that you have at hand will determine your sleepiness as well. So if you have a complex task that demands your attention, you're more likely to stay awake, something that's monotonous, repetitive, you're most likely to fall asleep. How about endogenous stimuli? Well, emotions, certainly that plays a role. Motivation, physical exercise, and I'm going to talk to you about that. Posture is important, okay? So I can look out in the audience, maybe see some lid lagging now already during my <laughs> lecture, okay? And you're all sitting. If I ask you all to stand, I suspect that lid lagging would disappear. And if Virginia supplied you with cots, you'd probably all fall asleep by the end of my lecture. Age is important, and I'll dwell on that in just a moment. Now, what about the circadian cycle? This is your biological clock. Circadian means about one day, OK? The circadian cycle is linked to your core body temperature. It cycles as well. And it cycles with the sun. You've heard of melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone. It's excreted by the pineal gland. And its level function fluctuates with the core body temperature as well. 
other hormones cycle as well. If you're an asthmatic, your expiratory flow rate cycles with the core body temperature too, and it's at the lowest point at two to three in the morning, okay? And your cortisol level cycles and other uh, bodily functions cycle as well. Uh, here's what's interesting. This cycling is constant with aging, okay? And REM sleep, interestingly enough, is linked to this circadian cycle and the core body temperature. Here I'll mention to you my insomnia. I usually wake up every night at my second REM period. I look at the clock, it's always 2.30 in the morning. I don't know if you do that too, but that's because your REM cycle, your sleep cycles, they're linked to your core body temperature. Now this cycle can be changed, and of course you all know this because of jet travel. You go to Europe and you have to change, and what changes you is the bright light in the morning. It resets this circadian cycle. And here's what it looks like. So here is maximum alertness and minimum alertness. During the late morning, you're maximally alert. And during the night, in the middle of the night, two to three, you're maximally sleepy. And this is a 48-hour cycle. So just to review, because I'm going to use these terms as I go on here, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. That's why I spent this time first talking about sleep physiology. These are the ABCs of sleep. Sleep latency. That's from lights out to first sleep. What is the normal? Anywhere from five minutes to 20 minutes. If it's less than five minutes, you're probably pathologically, excessively sleepy, okay? If it's over 20 minutes, it's abnormal, okay? Sleep efficiency. This is the amount of time that you sleep divided by the time in bed. If we take somebody, put all those wires on them, and put them in our sleep center, it's amazing to me, but our normal is about 90%. So 90% of the time, even with all these wires sleeping in a foreign environment and knowing that you're being recorded, uh, people will sleep 90% or greater. And certainly you ought to be able to do this at home. REM sleep, we talked about this, rapid eye movement sleep. Non-REM sleep, uh, WASO, WASO. This is wake after sleep onset. So if you have a high way so in minutes, that means that your sleep is interrupted, fragmented at night, okay? And I'll talk to you more about this. The sleep histogram is the one that I just showed you. Those are the stages of sleep over the night. And we talked about the circadian cycle. Now, what happens to sleep with aging? This happens to all of us as we age. The sleep latency increases. It takes a little longer for you to fall asleep. Stage one and stage two sleep increase as well. Stage three sleep decreases with age. Okay? So your sleep is lighter. And your time spent awake after sleep onset increases too. What decreases with age? Your sleep efficiency, no longer 95%. Your latency to REM sleep, that's the time from uh, sleep onset to your first REM period. And the amount of REM sleep decreases as well, and as I mentioned, stage three sleep de three, uh, decreases. Now, let me make this point. If this was all that happened to you with aging, your hands would be up you know, when I ask you about your F-word score. You'd be, you'd be getting a satisfactory night sleep on a regular basis, okay? You wouldn't want to see or wouldn't need to see a sleep doctor. I like this slide. This is taken from Henry IV, Shakespeare's play, 
he put these words into Henry IV's mouth, 1597. O sleep, O gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse, how have I frightened thee that thou no more wilt weight my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness. Henry IV was an insomniac, okay? Now you might ask why. And I'll be honest with you, before I put this lecture together, I didn't know. I had to go uh, online and find out. But he had just deposed Edward II, put him in a dungeon, and starved him to death. And he was putting down a rebellion in Wales and Scotland, and he just discovered dissension in his court. People were out to get him, okay? So if Henry the Fourth had come into my office with these symptoms, okay, I would have told them, Henry, I want you to decrease the stress in your life. <laughs> so what is insomnia? It is unsatisfactory sleep with daytime consequences. So you have to have both, unsatisfactory sleep and daytime consequences. Now, I'm going to talk to you first about what I call primary insomnia. So this is not insomnia secondary to other sleep disorders or other comorbidities. We'll talk about that in a moment. This is primary insomnia all by itself, okay? And we divide it. Sleep maintenance insomnia is when your sleep efficiency is reduced. So you can get to sleep, but you can't stay to sleep. And we have the other type, too, sleep onset insomnia. That's where you have a prolonged latency to sleep, but once you get to sleep, you're okay. And then some people, God bless them, have both types. They can't get to sleep, and they also can't stay asleep. We also have early awakening. This is common in dementia. I'll talk to you about that in a slide uh, later. Insomnia comes as a transient type or a chronic type. So, for example, the loss of a loved one, the grief associated with it, stress in a job may only last a few weeks or a month, or you may have it for months or years at a time. This is important. It's a 24-hour disorder. So people with primary insomnia, I include myself here, uh, their motor runs faster than other people. Okay, I'm blessed with an active mind, and I'm happy to have it, but I'll be honest with you, sometimes at night, it's hard to turn it off, and that's why I'm waking up at 2.30, you know, solving problems instead of going back to sleep, and probably some of you are the same way, and people like me and some of you, our metabolic rate is increased, blood pressure and pulse are a little bit faster than everybody else, too. We can divide it into mild, moderate, or severe. Now, what are some of the daytime consequences? So these are daytime consequences of unsatisfactory sleep. This is what happens when you have primary insomnia, but as I discuss other comorbidities, other sleep disorders, these are the same consequences, okay? Cognitive dysfunction. So your thinking is not normal. You may have difficulty sustaining attention on a task. You may have a slowed response time and decreased performance. We call this psychomotor impairment. Your memory is impaired. And importantly, you have excessive daytime somnolence and fatigue. And some people have difficulty with balance as well. And some of you may have experienced this. Now, when you think about it, and again, I'll promise you a slide on depression and dementia, some of these symptoms are shared by people who have dementia and depression. So sometimes it's hard for a patient, a family, and a doctor to know the difference. Do they have a sleep disorder? Do they have depression? Do they have early dementia? Now, sleep hygiene. I put this slide in here because these are common sense, non-pharmacological ways for you to improve your likelihood of having a good night's sleep, okay? And you can do this even though you're sleeping pretty good, you can sleep better, and if you have mild insomnia, this might be all you need, okay? 
Your sleeping environment, very important. It has to be a comfortable temperature. So our bedroom, my wife and I sleep together in a king-sized bed. I like to have a, a, a comforter on me. It just makes me feel better, and I feel more secure, and I get a better night's sleep. And you have to have the temperature of the room down in order to sleep like that. It has to be quiet. You know, we close all the windows. There's a bit of traffic noise at our house, but with the air co on and the windows closed, it's quiet. Okay, very important. A mattress, critically important. Now, everybody's different here. My wife likes it harder. I like it softer. We've got a compromise, but I have to sleep on my side. In fact, I have to sleep on my left side to get a good night's sleep. And if you're a side sleeper, you have to have a cushion on top of your mattress. So you should have a moderately firm mattress with a pillow top, and then I put on top of that one of those foam uh, layers so that I can sleep on my left side through the night. And it's important to pay attention to that detail. Otherwise, you wake up with a stiff neck, sore back, sore shoulder. Important that you retire and awaken at the same time each day, seven days a week. Now, I don't want you to get obsessive about this and set your clock by it, but rough numbers, you know, you go to bed at 9.30, 10, you wake up at 6, 6 6.30 in the morning on a regular basis. Your bed should only be used for sleep and sex, for nothing else. So you don't want to condition yourself to do anything but sleep in bed. You don't want to watch television. You don't want to read. You don't want to do uh, your taxes. You don't want to eat in bed. You want to do none of that. You want to only sleep in bed. You want to avoid the prolonged use in the evening of electronic devices. Now, what do we do for patients where this isn't enough, okay, and they have primary insomnia? And here's some recommendations for those people. Some people, they wake up, they look at the clock, they freak out, and they say, my God, uh, you know, I'm just going to be a wreck in the morning. Well, if you're one of those people, turn the clock around, okay? So you don't see it when you wake up at night. Regular exercise, critically important. But you have to do it properly. If you don't sleep well, I recommend that you exercise in the late afternoon at least four hours before you go to sleep. And you ought to do the right amount of exercise. If you push too hard, get a lot of lactic acidosis in the muscles in your legs, your legs will ache and you'll have a hard time falling asleep. So you want to exercise for rough numbers 45 minutes. You want to do enough to work up a sweat and increase your body temperature. If you do that, you get a better night's sleep. No caffeine after lunch. So I looked this up. You know how much caffeine is in a grande Starbucks? 330 milligrams. Diet Coke, my wife's favorite, 47 milligrams. Red Bull, uh, 8.4 ounces, 80 milligrams. But here you can hang your hat on this. 200 milligrams of caffeine in the morning can still be detected 18 hours later. That's how long it hangs around. Now, of course, it's not the same amount that you consumed in the morning. It's much less. But that's why if you're having trouble sleeping, either go to decaf or don't drink any caffeine after lunch. No alcohol or nicotine uh, after dinner. And I'll talk to you at the uh, end about the impact of alcohol and nicotine on sleep. Uh, Many people recommend don't go to bed uh, hungry. But here you have to be sensible. If you have GERD, you have reflux, and you're bothered by it when you lay down, then you can't eat a big meal before you go to bed. You just want a small snack. A warm bath or a shower to increase your body temperature will help as well. Worry time, okay? So here's what I mean by worry time. You've got stress, you've got problems, your mind is racing. Sit down, write down the solutions on a piece of paper, and then put paper and pencil uh, by your bedside. So when you wake up at 2.30, I can't tell you how many problems I've solved at 2.30. 
my brain's racing, and all of a sudden the solution is crystal clear. And instead of turning it over 16 times in my head, I write it down and then dismiss it and then go back to sleep. Okay. There are a variety of relaxation techniques, and I promote this. You should have a ritual to prepare yourself for sleep, to prepare yourself for sleep. So here I'll tell you a story. Some of you may remember uh, NYPD Blue. It was a popular television show a long time ago. It was very intense, and it was always on late. My wife and I loved it, but finally it was so intense that I couldn't go to sleep afterwards, so I had to stop watching it, okay? And that was before you can record it, okay? So you have to get yourself ready. You may want to go for a casual walk in the evening before you go to bed, that sort of thing. Okay. Now, I picked these because these are the, the most common ones, and some of you in the room are going to have one, two, or three of these. Obstructed sleep apnea, circadian rhythm disturbance, and restless leg syndrome. Here's a cross-section of the head, the nose, the hard palate, the tongue, the jaw, the back of the throat. Air should enter the nose and mouth, pass without obstruction through the back of the throat. We call this the pharynx, down into the air tube. People with obstructive sleep apnea have obstruction in the pharynx, either here behind the soft palate, behind the tongue, or below the tongue, or in all portions. And here is what we call an epic. This is a 30-minute sec uh, segment from a sleep study, okay? And here are the EEGs, EOGs, and everything up here. I want to call your attention here to these uh, channels down here. This is airflow, and here the patient's breathing. Here there's no flow. And here the chest and the abdomen are moving in what we call a paradoxical fashion because the air cannot get down into the lungs because there's obstruction here. And the oxygen falls. The patient gasps and chokes. Here's what it sounds like. <sighs> like this. Opens the airway, breathes for a while, and then the cycle repeats itself. Now some of you are shaking your head, especially the women, because you've heard your husband do this that <laughs> night. Who has obstructive sleep apnea? If you're in a working population, younger population, maybe only 4%. As you age, as a male, many more people will develop it. It seems to peak out in the 40s and then plateau after that. Women who are premenopausal, they are spared until they're postmenopausal, and then they begin to catch up. If you have atrial fibrillation, rough numbers, 45% of those patients will have obstructive sleep apnea, and we believe there's a direct connection between the two. What are the symptoms? Snoring, gasping and choking, as I've uh, uh, demonstrated. Restless sleep and observed apnea. Now, the sleep fragmentation that occurs as a result of this breathing problem will lead to the symptoms that I've already mentioned to you in consequences. Very important, this last point. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, moderate to severe disease, you are impaired as a driver. You are just as impaired as a person who is legally drunk. If we put patients with obstructive sleep apnea, put them in a driving simulator, they make just as many mistakes as people who are legally drunk. You add the two together, it's lethal. How do we make the diagnosis? Well, we look for predisposing disorders. And certainly one of the most important is obesity. And because we're in the middle of an obesity epidemic, there is an obesity and obstructive sleep apnea epidemic as well. People with hypothyroidism, some craniofacial disorders, and stroke too. Now, sleep apnea is associated with, that is, it is a risk factor for other disorders, high blood pressure, stroke, heart attack, heart failure, atrial fibrillation, and diabetes. Independent risk factor for those disorders, above and beyond diabetes and obesity. Now, here's a real sleep histogram. This is from a patient. They went into non-REM sleep. Here's their first REM period. 
They've got one, two, three cycles. They slept on their back and their side. But we tracked apneas and desaturations. They didn't have any. Here's what it looks like when you have bad obstructive sleep apnea. So your sleep is fragmented. All the red bars are apnea. All the green bars are what we call hypopnea, when you don't breathe enough. And those are all the desats and arousals. So this fragments your sleep. You may be in bed for a long time, but the quality of your sleep is not normal. How do we treat? Weight loss. We avoid alcohol and hypnotics because that relaxes the back of the throat and predisposes to obstruction. Good sleep hygiene. This is very important, nocturnal positioning. This is why I sleep on my side. So here, you can see the sleep hypnogram again, or histogram, and this patient sleeps on their back, boom. They've got a lot of apneas and desaturation. They go to their side on their right, they all disappear. They go back to the back, they all come back. And this is very typical because when you're on your back, gravity brings your tongue back into your throat and you obstruct. And if your airway is vulnerable, then you're gonna have problems. You roll onto the side, that disappears. CPAP, some of you in this room may be on CPAP, okay? How does this work? Well, there's obstruction here. We put a mask on, then we attach it to your face with elastic Velcro straps. We attach the mask to a hose and the hose to a compressor. The compressor blows a little bit of air through gently through the nose, and it's really simple. All it does is inflate the back of your throat so you don't obstruct anymore. Well, does it work? Well, here's our patient. Pretty bad disease. And here we ramped him up to 15, we call this 15 centimeters of water pressure, sleeping on his back. Look at what happened. Everything disappeared, all the obstruction disappeared. And he had a huge, what we call REM rebound. He was in dreaming sleep the majority of that part of the night. This patient will leave the lab saying, that's the best night's sleep I've had in years. Now here's something you can do for yourself. This is called a breathe right. You've probably seen this on football players, okay? And it's an elastic band-aid with a plastic leaf spring. You put it on the nose after you clean the nose off with alcohol or soap and water. It lifts the side or the ala of the nose up and improves nasal airflow. Nasal airflow is key to prevent obstruction downstream in the pharynx. And here's a little study from Scandinavia. It's, it's very old. Ten patients, the solid bars before, the hatch bars after applying uh, an external nasal dilator, a breathe right. And you can see it makes a big difference. I wear one of these every night, and it improves my sleep. You can get them at Costco. That's the best place to get them. So this is a mandibular advancing appliance. I'm proud to say the first device of this type was developed here in our sleep center in 1985, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and now there's, there's a hundred of them. This is what I think is the best. It's called a clearway appliance. A dentist has to make it. It fits on the teeth of your upper, uh, your mandible, and on the teeth of I mean, of your maxilla, and then on the teeth of your mandible. And it can be adjusted, and it brings your mandible forward, brings your tongue forward, and opens the back of your throat. It is effective in some patients, but not everybody. Now, how about a circadian rhythm disturbance? Now, I picked this one because I think many of us, I'm including myself a little bit, I don't have this much, uh, have advanced sleep phase syndrome, okay? And this is where you go to bed early and then you wake up early. So your circadian uh, cycle is shifted, okay? So you may go to bed at 6 and wake up at 2 or go to bed at 8 and wake up at 4. Here I want to make this point. The sleep architecture, if you have this disorder, could be entirely normal. So you will awaken at four, and as long as you've gotten eight hours of sleep, you're going to feel fine, okay? 
But problems arise, and here's some of the problems that do. So you're thinking, I don't want to go to bed at 6 or 8, and social pressures will keep you up later, but you still wake up at 4. So now you have sleep restriction, you don't have 8 hours anymore, and you're sleepy during the day. And this early morning awakening may be confused with depression. It also can lead to evening napping, okay, and delayed uh, sleep onset. How do we treat this? Bright light in the evening, okay? Don't turn the lights off and watch television. Keep the lights on if you want to stay awake, okay? And uh, dark light or block light in the morning. How about restless leg syndrome? There's probably a handful of people in this room that has this disorder. This is a disagreeable sensation. It's usually in the legs and the calves, but when it's bad, it can be in the arms as well. And patients describe it uh, as if there were worms in their legs or soda pops, bubbles in their veins. It's very uncomfortable. And there's a circadian cycle to this, too. It's usually worse at night, and it's worse with inactivity. So when you're laying in bed trying to go to sleep, that's when it comes on, and it produces sleep onset insomnia. And how do you fix it? Well, patients, they get out of bed, they walk around, they rub their legs, it gets better, they go back to bed, and it comes back. So this can be a problem, okay? 5 to 15% of the general population. It can be a primary disorder that's inherited. I've seen patients' families like this. Uh, iron deficiency uh, can produce it. So menstruating females can uh, develop this. It's reversed with iron therapy. And end-stage renal disease. So there may be somebody in this room who has kidney failure. And kidney failure uh, is associated with this problem as well. How do you treat it? Well, you avoid caffeine, alcohol, SSRIs. Those are the antidepressant medications because those make it worse. Stretching and heat, iron replacement. And these drugs are the drugs we commonly use. Requip, a dopamine agonist, is the one that's probably moved, used most frequently. Okay, here's a list of what we call comorbidities or other problems and this is a laundry list of uh, diseases and disorders that some of you may have that will interrupt or fragment your sleep. So the first one's a, a no-brainer. If you're in pain, you go to bed, the pain keeps you up. Well, how do you solve that? Well, you go to your doctor, you find out why you have pain, you fix it if you can, and then it's appropriate to medicate yourself prior to bedtime. You have to be cautious, though. If you use an opiate, a strong, sedating sort of medication, and you have a vulnerable airway, you'll make obstructive sleep apnea worse. But if you use something like Motrin or Tylenol, you'll be fine. Okay, posture is important. So I have some mild back pain, some shoulder pain, and that's why I have a mattress like I do. I've got a pillow that's just special. And I have to very carefully position my spine in a neutral position, hips, spine, neck, so that it's not torqued, so I don't wake up in the morning with pain. And if you have that problem, you have to pay attention to that detail too. Heart failure. Some of you may have heart failure, and you know when you lay down flat, you get short of breath, and it wakes you up. And usually that awakening occurs early on in the night. Kidney failure. I mentioned that people with kidney failure will have restless leg syndrome. Many of them have what's called the uremic syndrome with itching or pruritus, and that keeps them up as well. Reflux, very common problem. I have it. So if you eat a big meal, if you have coffee or alcohol before dinner and it relaxes the sphincter, you're going to have reflux, you're going to cough, gag at night, and it'll keep you up. Nocturia, that's our uh, fancy word for peeing in the middle of the night, okay, nocturia. And there's a whole lot of causes. If you're a guy and you're elderly, most likely it's your prostate. And there's remedies for this. You go to your doctor, you get some pills, and that takes care of it. If our patients have nocturia, we always ask them to restrict fluids 
after dinner. Okay, it's just common sense. I had a patient the other day on Thursday, he drank a half a bottle of water just prior to going to bed, and he woke up two or three times at night, okay, to pee. So it's not sensible. Most patients can figure this out by themselves. If you have heart failure, and if you're on a water pill, Lasix, for example, if you take it twice a day and your last dose is in the evening, then you're going to pee when you uh, are sleeping. So ask your doctor to change it to the morning. Okay. Asthma. I mentioned to you that the lowest airflow is 3 o'clock in the morning. So if you're marginally controlled with your asthma, it's not uncommon to have symptoms and for you to be awakened in the middle of the night. If you have COPD, emphysema chronic bronchitis, you may cough or your oxygen may fall at night. And depression. So a whole lot of people, 60 to 80% of people who have depression report insomnia. Here is some of the common abnormalities. Early morning awakening is probably the most common. There are a whole slew of REM abnormalities that occur as well. I mentioned to you that depression can be confused at times with the advanced sleep phase syndrome because of the early morning awakening. SSRIs, this is how we uh, treat them, they improve subjective sleep, but they impact sleep in a negative fashion. They suppress REM, and there is uh, some decrease in sleep continuity. Dementia. Some of you may have loved ones with dementia. Sleep complaints are very common. There's a prolonged sleep latency, an increase of wakefulness after sleep onset, and early morning awakenings. As the disease progresses, you get a complete reversal of day and night. So the patients are asleep during the day and awake at night. It's a terrible problem for the patient and for the caregiver. My mother, God bless her, she passed last April. She had Alzheimer's dementia. She lived for the last year and a half in a wonderful home. But at the end, she had all these problems, waking up at night, wandering. And it's, it was terrible for her, terrible for us, and for her caregivers. So here's some drugs. And if you look these up in a pharmacology text, they'll come under the heading of central nervous system stimulants, okay? Now, we've already talked about caffeine. That one's familiar with you. But you probably don't know about the other two. Theophylline is a methylxanthine. It's an old-fashioned bronchodilator, and we give it to patients with COPD. And they complain of insomnia because it's sort of like caffeine. Does anybody know what theobromide is? That's in chocolate, okay? That's the methylxanthine in chocolate. You eat too much chocolate, it's going to keep you awake. Some of you are going to be on beta blockers, okay, uh, for blood pressure, for heart rate control. And this will increase perceived dreams, decrease sleep continuity, and increase perceived awakenings. Corticosteroids, commonly used for a variety of diseases, if you take enough, this is like drinking a pot of coffee. It'll jazz you up. We used to call it steroid euphoria, but all my patients, it's really dysphoria. It's an uncomfortable feeling. They don't like it. Nicotine is a central nervous system depression. Alcohol. Alcohol suppresses the central nervous system. It promotes sleep but it also fragments your sleep. So if you drink alcohol before you go to bed, you'll wake up in the morning with an unrefreshing night of sleep. Melatonin, I mentioned this to you. It's a natural hormone. It's reduced in some of us with uh, insomnia. It is sleep promoting. It's not a, a hypnotic. It's not like the drugs I'm gonna talk about in a moment. It promotes sleep. It's non-addictive, it's fairly free from uh, side effects, but it's short-acting. There's a new drug out. Some of you may have read about it, Rosarim. I confess to you I've never uh, prescribed it yet. It is a melatonin receptor agonist, and it acts like melatonin, but it has a longer half-life, 
and it has promise for people like us, you know, who struggle with sleep. Benadryl is an over-the-counter antihistamine, and it is the antihistamine and all the over-the-counter drugs that you see, uh, like nitol and so forth. Trazodone is a prescription drug, and some of you may be on this. This is an SSRI. It's an antidepressant, but it sedates. It does increase stage 3. It decreases REM, and it produces some drowsiness and dizziness in patients oftentimes. Now, these are old-time uh, hypnotics, sleep drugs, and they may be familiar to some of you. You may have taken them in the past. Halcyum, Dalmain, Restoril, Ativan. They're older. They produce drowsiness, cognitive impairment, impaired coordination. They predispose to falls at night, impaired driving. We don't use these drugs anymore, okay? And here's, I put three of the most commonly used drugs. You're familiar with them, I'm sure, from advertisements. Some of you may use them. These are newer. They have a shorter half-life and fewer side effects. Now, how about some principles? Now, I give these to you as patients because I'll be honest with you, not every primary care physician knows all this stuff, okay? So you have to know about it, you've got to be smart about it, and you have to make sure you're getting the right treatment. And if you're getting a drug, you want the lowest effective dose. You want to use it short term, not chronically. You can intermittently dose yourself. So you have grief, the loss of a loved one, you take it for a short time, and then you stop, okay? Short half-life drugs, as I mentioned, are preferable. And if you're on it for any length of time and you have to stop it, I have a good friend who's been on it for a month. He's post-op, big surgery, and he stopped it two days ago, and he's got insomnia. Very common for you to have insomnia as a withdrawal symptom from these drugs. You've got to be patient, gradually reduce it, and then wait for that to disappear. Okay, I'll take some questions.